Okay, so today we'll talk about NumPy, and after having gone over the midterm homework for the reminder that I'll be in San Diego, so I won't be teaching on Wednesday, and homework number five. Okay, so NumPy, um, I've mentioned it numerous times in this class already. It's um, a library that you that is, uh, in a sense, a standalone Python library, and it describes itself as follows. NumPy is the, they don't say A, they say the fundamental package for scientific computing with Python. It contains, among other things, a powerful n-dimensional array object. And most of today will be about showing you how that n-dimensional array object works. Sophisticated broadcasting functions, tools for integrating C and C++ and Fortran code into a Python program, which I won't talk about um, today, and useful linear algebra, Fourier transform, and random number capabilities. Besides its obvious scientific uses, NumPy can also be used as an efficient multidimensional container of generic data. At arbitrary data types can be defined. This allows NumPy to seamlessly and speedily integrate with a wide variety of databases. It's BSD licensed so that you can um, use it in other places with very little restrictions. Um, among free software, there are two big licenses. One is called the GPL, which is um, you're allowed to freely use the software, but if you um, modify the software in some way or include it in your own software and redistribute the resulting software, then you have to license your code under the GPL, S which means other people then have to do the same thing. This makes companies um, somewhat uncomfortable because they might like to take some code and uh, put it inside of, say, Windows, and they don't want to have to license all of Microsoft Windows under the GPL because then you're required to give it away for free. The BSD license, on the other hand, um, anybody can just take the code, stick it in some <coughs> commercial product or whatever, and they have they don't have to give back the code in any way. They can make changes, redistribute the result as part of a closed source program, etc. Um, so, some people find this uh, very unrestrictive license to be really nice. So this is NumPy, and just to emphasize, um, if you know someday you're using Python completely independently of Sage, you'll almost certainly have NumPy easily installable in uh, whatever context you're using Python, so like in Windows or whatever. Okay, so what we're going to do today is um, basically I'm just going to show you a demo slash tutorial of using NumPy to work with these n-dimensional array objects. There are several very surprising ways in which NumPy arrays work that are potentially counterintuitive, so I'll emphasize those the most. Um, and that's it. That's what we're going to do. This worksheet actually, I made it a lot longer than what I'm going to go over today. It has kind of an entire extra worksheet that's just about integrating NumPy and Cython. It's possible to use this um, NumPy array object, which is this multi-dimensional <coughs> container of data, in a very efficient way from Cython and get very low-level access to the underlying um, data. And uh, there's really good support in Cython for doing that, with or without bounds checking, etc. So um, this gets used enormously. Um, but that's not going to be, I don't have enough time to talk about that today. Um, also, what I've written below is based somewhat on the tutorial that you'll find at the NumPy website, which is called the Tentative NumPy Tutorial. Um, but I really only took the first two or three sections and I changed them a lot. But that's what this is based on. Okay, the most important thing to start with is that you can't just use NumPy and Sage without importing it. You have to say import NumPy and then you have available, once you do that, a bunch of new functions. Um, so if I do numpy.tab at this point, oops, uh, you'll see that there are a large number of things that are defined in this numpy library. So we've gotten through B so far, and this just goes on and on, and on and on and on and on. So there's a lot of stuff in here. Hmm? Is there a reason it's not just available in here? Yeah, the main reason is that it takes a while to import which may, it may not have looked like it took very long, but um, that is the reason. If you time it, so there's a sage-startup time. Um, that's a way you can run sage in the command line with the option dash startup time, and it will check to see how long each module takes to import. And it turns out importing NumPy is you know, a substantial fraction of a second. And if, uh, if the disk cache is cold, that is none of the files have been loaded into memory, it can be more noticeable. So to avoid, to make the startup time a little bit faster, it's required that you explicitly import it. That's the only reason. Yes? Nope, because it's all contained in the num... Wait, overlap in the sense of namespaces? No. Everything in NumPy is under the NumPy 
um, name. So it doesn't like delete or change any existing functions in Sage. But it does have some overlap. What? Yeah, exactly. So um, Sage has its own thing, which is called, say, arc cosine, which is symbolic. Like you can give it pi and it gives you back arc cosine of pi, or it'll, it'll do simplifications. Um, if NumPy has something called arc cosine, which it does, that one is going to be a completely different one. Um, but I mean, maybe it's, let's see, where did it come from? Look, let's look at it. I mean, it could do the same thing. So, um, uh, like, apparently it does the same thing on pi as input, but I mean, it may be hard to tell the difference between the two. Invalid value encountered, okay, that could be. Because it's less than or equal to one. Um, I don't know if there's, ah, so notice that those two are different. Um, one of them is taking a sage real number, so an arbitrary precision real number, giving you back that sort of thing. The other one's turning it into a float, if it can, and then giving it back. Okay, so there are two completely different arc cosine functions. This one is mainly, um, everything in NumPy is written by and aimed at people doing numerical computing, mainly applied mathematics, um, biology, scientific visualization type people. Um, I mean, most of them aren't even mathematicians, are not mathematicians, they're mostly um, people in industry and uh, working at NASA and that sort of thing. So, uh, and by the way, just to give a sense of who these people are, so um, NumPy's history, when I first started using Python in around 2003, there were two libraries for doing numerical matrix or, um, uh, arithmetic and, uh, you know, kind of working with numerical matrices. One was called NumArray and the other one was called Numeric. So instead of... You know, each one could say, we are the library for numerical computing, but um, there were two of them. And I think one of them was designed by people doing stuff with relatively smaller, small matrices, and the other one was designed by some um, astronomers doing things with very large matrices. And the large matrix one was really good for large matrices, but bad for small matrices, and conversely. And so their designs are sort of, uh, so people would base their library on one or the other, or maybe they'd write complicated code, they had different interfaces. And this guy, Travis Oliphant, um, who is, I think, a professor at Brigham Young University, BYU, sat down and spent an enormous amount of time unifying these two libraries and coming up with a single new library called NumPy, basically just by pure effort. And um, the result of that was that uh, he really unified the numerical Python community behind this one library. So you won't find anybody using NumArray or Numeric anymore, as far as I know. Every single library that depends on something depends Numerical will depend on NumPy. Yes? And when do you issue um, I don't know when the exact release schedule, but um, my impression is it was around mid, like about when Sage, around the same time that Sage was starting. So around 2005, 2006, 2007, uh, around those times. So when I started Sage, it was really unclear whether we should use numeric or numeric. We didn't have either of them in Sage for a while. And then I think for a while we maybe had uh, numeric in there, or we had one of the two, but um, uh, actually, no, I think we had neither of them, and then we finally put NumPy in. I'm not sure what the history was exactly, but it's all about six or seven years ago. One thing that happened, um, possibly a cautionary tale, depending how you look at it, is this guy spent so much effort and time doing this that he didn't get tenure at BYU, mm -hmm. um, even though he really wanted to, and um, that may be very bad, but on the other hand, he got a really nice job as the vice president of NThought, which is um, a numerical Python consulting company that's very successful. So um, uh, he's probably much better off financially than he would be otherwise. And like right now he's starting some sort of foundation to support open source free Python for developing countries and that sort of thing. So, um, so he's doing really well. But, um, but he didn't get tenure and I think most of the reason was because BYU didn't appreciate um, uh, contributions to software. So in Computer science that might be appreciated a lot, but in mathematics departments, it's not. There's not really uh, currently. It's not as appreciated as say a paper in, you know, as, at a top journal, or a bunch of papers in top journals, for better or worse, um, probably for worse. Um, okay, so there you are. There, NumPy defines a lot of things, but none of them overwrite stuff that's in Sage. So when you type import NumPy, you're not going to suddenly change anything that you're used to using. Okay. 
And you might imagine that could happen. In fact, Python is able to do that. It could be that when you do import NumPy, some code is run that does import Sage and sees that Sage is there and then changes some things in ways to, uh, to confuse people. But that's not what happens with NumPy, as far as I know. OK, so now there are some basic definitions. Um, NumPy has this array object, and it's an n-dimensional array object. It's not just for working with matrices. And so um, in all their documentation, they use these definitions. So the main object of NumPy, which is one single type of object called an array, uh, is the homogeneous multidimensional array. And what it is is it's a table of usually numbers, um, all of the same data type, indexed by a tuple of positive integers. So the thing is there, instead of just having a row and a column, you could have just a row. Or you could have a row, a column, and another dimension. So you can have several different dimensions. The indexes into this, or this um, homogeneous array of data are a tuple, an n-tuple, where n is the number of dimensions. And we'll see lots of examples. Of this. Um, the, the dimensions are called axes, kind of like the x, y, and z axes. And the number of different axes is called the rank. So this is a rank one NumPy array, because it has only one axis, only one uh, thing you need to index into it. Here's a rank two NumPy array. This just looks like a normal two by two array. And here is a rank three array. You can think of a rank three NumPy array as simply a, a finite list of two by two matrices, all the same size. But you could also make rank four arrays, which would be like a bunch of lists of two by two matrices. But it's not just that. I mean, you can work with these things amazingly efficiently. It's incredibly efficient. Like just tuned, they have tuned the heck out of every operation that you can do on these. And you can do things like, uh, you know, give me standard deviations of these columns, um, give me variances of those rows, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's really a lot you can do with these, um, as you'll see. OK, so going back up to the definition again. I guess that's pretty much it. So those are the, the hard definitions. Uh, it's a homogeneous multidimensional array of data. Um, it's indexed by several different numbers, and you call the number of different or the different sort of index positions axes. Okay. And there's this attribute shape, which if you make an ND array, a NumPy ND array, by the way, its data type is numpy.nd array. This is a lot different than in Sage, where you'll find that each matrix, so matrices over different fields have different data types. Um, there's an inheritance hierarchy and so on. In NumPy, every single thing that you encounter regarding the array is just a numpy.nd array. There's exactly one data type. The um, underlying data that's stored in that object depends on a certain attribute of it. You can store ints, you can store floats, you can store arbitrary Python objects, et cetera, et cetera. There are a whole bunch of different data types. OK, so just to emphasize that, let's look at this rank 3 ND array. And notice its type is exactly the same. Um, so the data types that NumPy supports are a whole bunch of um, data types that numerical computing people would feel familiar with. They're very much like the ones in MATLAB. So different sizes of floating point numbers, different sizes of integers, and so on. And then there's one other type that you're allowed to have, which is called object, which is a completely arbitrary Python object. It's a homogeneous collection of data where all the data is a Python object, which can be anything. It could be Sage objects, could be whatever. But these will not be nearly as fast. Um, depending on what you're doing, but um, it's blazingly fast to work with these built-in types. These types that are supported at the machine level. It's not going to be blazingly fast to deal with Python objects. And uh, many of the algorithms assume that each of the objects in your matrix, um, their size is the same as every other object in the matrix or in the array. So it's homogeneous. And that's so in numerical computing, data is very, very often homogeneous, which is really good from the point of view of parallel computing and storing data and working with it. In, say, algebraic and symbolic computation, often your data is very heterogeneous in the sense that, you know, you have different numbers and they have different sizes and you have polynomials and kind of every single object you might consider, there's a lot of different, it can be arbitrarily big in a lot of different ways. And so this, um, this tension is kind of uh, a problem. Is, I mean, we've had stage days with the main authors of NumPy and, you know, when we tell them what we would like, 
we meaning you know number theorists, they're like, you want a matrix where your integers can be all kinds of different sizes? How can you possibly want that? You know, they think we're crazy. Because um, obviously there aren't you know two to the fifth, there aren't two to the hundred of anything really in the world. So why would you need them to be entries in a matrix? Okay, so back to the story. Let's make our array, and then um, there's an attribute shape which tells you what the different um, uh, basically the number of it's like the number of rows, columns, and the other axis. So the number of the zeroth axis, first axis, and second axis. But again, you could have ten different axes. Perfectly um, possible. All you'd have to do is put uh, sort of more complicated data here. Okay, and then oh, please. I'm talking about the shape here. That to me, intuitively, I would look at that and one would be two three two. Yeah, so would I, but it's not. So sorry. So, so um, I guess I'm, I'm, what I'm asking is what is the, the correct. Well, one thing we can do is. Um, we can get at any of the entries. So let's see what, and you can do really nice slicing. So you can say, uh, if you do this, then it gives you, uh, so the, the first, so the, the, thing, the index on the very left, the first axis, that is, that refers to the top matrix and then the second matrix. So the first axis, so it's like, Used to. I mean, it's just how it's printing. You could have thought of it in a different way. But if you think of this as two matrices, the very first entry is saying which of those two matrices. And then these two are telling you uh, which row and which column. Okay? And you would have like switched it around. But. Is there yes? A difference between that and just saying A and not? Um, I think that's the same, actually. I don't remember. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, you could literally think of it as. it's. Which is really natural, because remember the original input that I gave was a look. I mean, it looks exactly like this. It's a list of lists of lists, and a square brackets zero is the zeroth entry in that list of lists of lists, and therefore it makes sense that that should be the you know the very leftmost index when you're indexing in. Otherwise, um, so this is actually a really good choice, because then a zero can be exactly the same as for the corresponding list. And if I do something like a i j k, I'm going to get the same thing as a i comma j comma k. So I think it matches up pretty nicely, actually. Now that I see it, does that make sense? So it, it basically the way the um, different axes, like the different the different number of entries in each axis, um, it's just exactly so that the indexing is the same. It's exactly the same as if you're indexing into this list of list of lists. So if we make the array that way, we can do something like just randomly a one two or a one one two better be equal to v one one two. That's my claim. Oh wait, you can't do that with the list. So I have to say like that. Yes. So that's what should be true. A i j k equals v i j k like that. That's pretty sensible, actually. Yes, Andre. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So it, so one thing um, related to that is NumPy itself is implemented entirely 100% in C. Just so you know. So if you ever want to look at the actual source code of NumPy, it's a C program, and uh, Cython, as I mentioned, is one way to get easy access to the underlying C data structure that a um, that a uses. So this, what this does is it copies into memory. Um, it turns each of these inputs into ints, into C ints, puts them in memory, and, um, and then it gives you a Python object that allows you to access various stuff about it. Um, let me show you some of the attributes. Um, but actually, just speaking of the C thing, I think there's one called buffer. What is it called? Well, we'll come to it in a second. But in a moment, I'll show you an attribute which gives you the underlying memory um, directly. You can also do things like make a big NumPy array and ask it to not bother to initialize the memory, because you're going to maybe go through and do that with an algorithm, and it'll be kind of almost instantaneous to make the big array, which can be really nice if you're trying to optimize for speed. Okay, so let me show you a few neat things you can do. Um, 
And this, this is going to seem very different than what you have in MATLAB or the other stuff in Sage. So really pretty neat or important to pay attention to what this does. So it's really, really different. And potentially, I mean, I've never personally done enough numerical analysis type stuff to understand why this is really powerful, but it feels like it would be really powerful. And clearly a lot of people doing numerical computing appreciate this sort of power a lot. So since a lot of you are applied people, you may as well. So let me show you how it works. Um, so what you can do is you can, get, you can make your array just like we did. And it, in memory, what it'll do is it'll make the C int, which has, it'll make the C int 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 in contiguous memory stored somewhere on the computer. And then you can do almost anything you want with that. You can say, give me back that same array using that exact same memory, but I want to view it instead as a 1, 1, 12 array. So it has, it's like one row, one column, and, or actually it's like one matrix that has one row and 12 columns. So instead of two matrices that each have two rows and three columns. So you can just arbitrarily transform your array so it has different it has a different shape. Um, you can even change, I think, the number of dimensions. Yeah, just like that. I want to view all that data as being a just has to you know add up to the right amount or multiply up to the right amount. I want to take all those numbers, they're stored in order, and I want to view them as a three by four array instead. This does not make a copy of the data that is now a three by four array. It really is exactly the same underlying data. If you change one of the entries of B, it changes the corresponding entry here. So if you have a if you have a bunch of homogeneous data, you can view it as you know an array of arrays of a certain shape. You can view it as a single long bit of linear data. You can view it as just a single array, whatever you want. And you can do that instantaneously. I mean, the amount of time it takes to do this reshape is just completely, I don't know. I don't know how long it is, but I bet it's really, really fast. Well, I wonder if, yeah, so it's fast. I mean, it's on the order of a, uh, on the order of nanoseconds. Yes, uh, Sarah has her hand up. Uh, let me think. So you have to have all the entries filled. Do you mean with reshape or when you make the thing in the first place? Um, uh, wait. Oh, when I did this. What if I did like three by three? Or I don't think I understand your question. Yes. <coughs> I didn't understand again. Sorry, but I will understand. Somebody. Make one that is oh, yeah, it has to be, has to be uh, rectangular. Every entry must be filled. However, you can, um, if you're purely interested in speed, you can, of course, ignore the entries that aren't filled, um, as long as that's not using up memory, as long as you're not worried about memory, because uh, obviously that will use some memory. But uh, you can make an n-dimensional array with whatever shape you want nearly instantaneously without it even initializing the memory. I'll show you a command to do that in a minute. Um, well, I'll just scroll down and show it to you. <coughs> so it's down um, near the end, right here. Or uh, no, actually, where is it? Empty. Yes, yeah, so there's a command numpy.empty. And what this does is it just makes an empty n dimensional array. Here n is three, three dimensional array. So with whatever parameters you want. It, the, the entries that will be in here are just random. They just it, it, it asks the system, give me memory, but it doesn't initialize them in any way. So if you do this, you have to initialize them yourself. And if you only initialize the ones you want, then it's kind of like what you want, except obviously there's some extra entries just sitting there, which will print as random scary stuff. But I'm just saying it's super fast. Like here's a little timing where you do it for 500 by 500. And making an empty one where you don't initialize the memory takes 1.7 micro, microseconds. If you do initialize all the entries to zero, it takes 115 microseconds. So it's dramatically faster to just not bother to initialize them. Obviously, that might not work for your algorithm, but it might. If you're just going to go through a for loop and fill them all in in some way, then, or some of them, then you don't need to bother initializing them directly to zero first. Yes? I think it just get an error. And I will confirm that. So six six two is fine. 
because it multiplies to 12. But 4 of 4 is no good. And you just get an error value error. Total size of new array must be unchanged. By the way, I'm not going to show you this, but you can also do crazy things like um, this A, there's an attribute D type which tells you the data type of the entries in the array. You can change that. You can just say, I'd like to view all my numbers now as 32 bit ints or as floats or whatever. And it will literally just like take the underlying memory and suddenly start viewing these things as floats. And it'll just like it look like a bunch of random you know, crazy stuff. But you can do that with a very little, just like instantaneously. So you, you're, you have this flexibility to do a lot of seemingly really odd stuff. I mean, you could have some operation that where you take your floating point numbers, view them all as ints, do something that makes sense only for ints, and then, then move back. I don't know. Um, but at least NumPy makes that easy to do and very, very fast. Okay, I'm going to change this one back to 3x4. Um, or we could do like 3x2x2x1. You can do whatever you want. See? I like 2x6. It's easier. Okay, and um, notice that in all this transformation of A, of sorry, when we do reshape, it doesn't change A. A is exactly the same shape. What it does is it gives us a new object that references the same memory as the original array, but has a different shape. So uh, basically these NumPy arrays, they, um, they have some information in them about their, the data type of the um, elements. There's a pointer to some chunk of memory. So view the memory as having entries that have this data type. And there's this shape. And you can have several different things like this that point at the same chunk of memory. You can also, when you slice into a matrix, say to give to get um, the first two rows, it'll give you that as a new NumPy array object, and it actually just points into the same memory. So you can very easily get slices. Say you get you want all the you know odd position columns of your NumPy array as a new array because you have some algorithm for which you can work on those easily then you can just ask for that, and it will give you it back. And then you feel like you have a completely new array that works just like any other NumPy array object, but it's actually operating on the same memory as the original one. So just to start showing you how that happens, um, if we take this B, and we notice A is, is what it is, but if you start changing entries of B, like let's change the, I don't know, uh, one row number one, position number three, to 199 then B is changed, and maybe there's some you know, algorithm where it's easy to express what we're doing on a 2 by 6 matrix, instead of having to work with this three-dimensional thing. Now notice that A itself is now changed, okay? Notice that now 199 is the lower left entry of A. So when you do reshape, you're getting back a copy of the object, sorry, we're getting back a new object, a new Python object, that points at exactly the same memory, but with some of those parameters changed. So just to emphasize that, um, you can have several different little kind of boxes like this that are pointing at the same memory. And one of them can be viewing the object as having integers in it, the other one's viewing it as having floats in it, the other's viewing it as a 3 by 3 by 3 by 3 array object, the other one's viewing it as something else. Okay? Yes? Um, so, so what if you wanted to make, uh, you, know, you wanted to reshape something there's a method dot copy. Very good question. So um, if you were to do instead b equals a dot copy dot reshape, um, I don't know, four by three, then that will give you a b. And now you can change this one at will. So b zero comma zero equals that. Now of course b will be changed. A is not going to have nine one nine three eight in it anymore. So the answer is dot copy open close parentheses. You want a shallow copy, and um, these data, these objects, uh, unless the de the D type is object, a shallow copy is a deep copy because the uh, entries are, are all just ints or floats or whatever. So when you copy them, that's it. You can't change them; they're immutable. Okay. So what have you learned so far? That there's import NumPy. NumPy has um, this method called array or function called array that gives you one of these n-dimensional array objects. And it ha when you get back one of them, you can access the entries in all kinds of nice ways. There's a dot reshape method, i.e. you can view 
the data in a lot of different ways simultaneously, and copy gives you a whole new copy of one of those objects. And now here are the some of the important attributes which I hinted at there. Um, so the number of axes dimensions of the array. So for the array A that we were using, it had, remember it was two two by three matrices. And so that has three different axes. So you can, when you index it, you give a three tuple. Let me just print out A since we're, we're using it a whole bunch. So the number of axes is N dim. The shape, um, that's the thing we're resizing. Um, the size is just the total number of elements. And the D type, that describes the data type of the elements in there. So when you give a list of lists of whatever, of lists, um, NumPy will try to decide on a D type that it thinks makes sense for your objects, just like Sage does that with the matrix command. And it's pretty aggressive. So if, it, if all of your objects look like integers and can fit in the word size of your computer, so they will fit in, say, 64-bit integers, then it will just make them, it'll make the d-type 64-bit integers. If your objects don't fit in 64-bit integers, it'll, use, it'll just use the object type, because it doesn't have anything that will fit bigger numbers. Um, if the numbers look like floats, it'll use those. So often, um, in practice, to be careful, you probably want to explicitly specify the d-type, if you know what it is, if you know what you want. So you can say, you can make an n-dimensional array and just say d-type equals, and then give some type. Yeah, when it's making the array, it'll turn um, the numbers that you give it into its internal type, which is some which maps to some type on the computer, some hardware type, except if the type of thing is object. Um, item size, this is how big it views each of the, in bytes, each of the um, elements of the array. So in 64, it's an integer type where integers are represented using 64 bits, that is eight bytes of memory. Each integer, um, is assigned 64 bit int. First bit is the sign, and the other bits are the, um, the number. I wanted to work with stuff that I knew would be small. Yep. Would it make much of a difference to print that? Um, I don't, I think so. Uh, probably depends on the computer. Um, uh, it should use less memory. I think it will pack it. So it will literally use you know, half as much memory. If they're all going to be 32 bit, so in fact, let's try that. Um, try making it with D type 32. I have to get the constructor. So by the way, there is uh, one of the attributes is a.data, which is just the total, just the underlying data in memory. Um, so I think we can say like D type equals int 16. Um, so I'll just call this a16. So there's a dot. Um, data for 16, and then here is it for 64. And I don't know whether or not a16.data has like some way of telling how much memory it uses. Um, looks like that uses 24 somethings, um, maybe 24 words. Let's see what a64 does. Two, two somethings. Hmm, what does that mean? So I don't know what. The, oh no, no, I forgot to say data. So. Ah, so 96. So notice um, this a16.data, this is some like lightweight Python wrapper around uh, just a contiguous chunk of memory. And when I said d type equals in 16, then these numbers got stored in 16 bit integers. And it took up a lot less memory than storing them in 64 bit integers. So it really is efficient. It's pretty neat. And but of course, what happens if we take a16 and say multiply it by some number that's kind of big? What do you think will happen if I go, I don't know, 8 times a16? Any ideas? Overflow? Be nice, like something will happen. Um, let's see what happens. So it's definitely not so bad. Um, in fact, it looks perfectly fine. Let's try multiplying by something bigger. 2 to the 4th. So far, so good. So this is, uh, let's see, how about 2 to the 8? Okay, 2 to the 16. Oh no, look at that. It's even more fun if you do 2 to the 15. So you don't get overflow error, you don't get an exception. 
You don't get a warning. You get a wrong answer from, say, the perspective of one person. And from the perspective of another person, you get exactly the right answer. This, these are 16-bit names. <coughs> it's exactly what it should do. They're not arbitrary precision integers. The semantics for how arithmetic with 16-bit ints works is um, you're, you know, it wraps around. It just it does the multiplication and kind of uh, reduces modulo two to the 16, and then it gives you some normalized result. So um, watch out, because if you think your numbers are all going to be small, but you mess up and they actually get big, you will silently just get totally wrong answers. Unless, of course, you specifically are trying to work modulo a power of 2 or something. Um, OK? Yes? Yes. That's why I had to put it in quotes. Um, there might also be a, I, I don't know, it could be. I'll find out soon enough. Maybe there's a numpy dot in 16. Um, nope, those are the possibilities. So in fact, if you do numpy dot tab, you can see some of the supported types. There's something like 20 or 30 different um, fixed precision types. But, um, uh, and you can look in their documentation. There's a whole bunch of different ones that involve floats. So six, zero, I don't know what int zero is actually, I have no idea. But maybe it's bits. It could be bits. That would be really useful, right? Um, I don't know what it is. Yeah, I, I would say it one. I don't know. But they have 0, 16, 32, 64, and 8. And I have no idea what int 0 is. I just don't know. You could. Might give you something. Let's see. Huh. Looks like int 0 is the same as int 64. So there's at least int 8. So, so you have a lot of these different <coughs> types. And um, very good support for fixed size things that can be mapped to the machine data structures. Sage does not have good support for that directly, but it does through NumPy. OK. Um, let's see. Oh, quick warning, dangerous bend. There's an array data type in Python itself, just standard included with Python. And if you do import array, then you'll have array.array. This is totally different and unrelated to the NumPy array. It's like the multi being called array. So try not to get confused. So um, I just make an example of an array here. Its type is array.array. .array. This one's numpy.nd array. ND arrays are just dramatically more powerful than the built-in Python array type. So there's, the only, you probably would never want to use the built-in Python array type. But if you're reading code, you might come across it. OK, so that's the warning. Done. Um, I think I just sort of told you everything about the D type already. So this is just another example where uh, this one's kind of a little scary, so let me show you what's happening here. So let's make um, this array. It says, oh, these integers all fit in 64-bit integers. And so it, it doesn't choose the smallest one. It just chooses 64 for some reason. And so it makes the array, and you can do arithmetic. Here's another example where it says, oh, this fits fine in a 64-bit integer. So it makes the types in 64. But now if you multiply it by 2, you get a negative number. So if you, you know, want to make sure that you're not going to overflow, make sure you're careful about what you're doing um, and be explicit. And if you were to make this number a little bit bigger, like this, I think, or no, you can explicitly say dtype equals object, and then you won't get overflow. But things are going to be dramatically slower if you do that. Instead of this chunk of memory being a bunch of like tints or doubles or whatever, it's going to be a bunch of pointers to Python objects. So everything's way, way different as far as cool stuff you can do efficiently. Um, also, if your input is, say, a list of integers, and one of the integers, at least one of the integers is big, then instead of getting int64, you get a, the dtype as an object. So you probably want to be really explicit about what your dtype is if you're using NumPy. And what oh, if you just give a float, like, um, let's see, if I were to do NumPy array, 2.5, then it, um, let's see what the D type of this is. Float 64. And then, just like before, we can do numpy.flo and see what the different float sizes are. So you can have 100, looks like you can have 128 bit, 32 bit, and 64 bit floats. Okay. That would be my guess. But I don't know whether that's correct or not, to be honest. 
And I don't have easy access to a 32-bit computer these days, so, um, so I don't even know. Okay, so now let me see. What else do I want to show you? Um, just some other quick things before we finish. Zeros, this should look a lot like MATLAB. I think you have a zeros function that will give you a matrix of all zeros or an ND array of all zeros. Ones gives you an ND array of all ones. By the way, there's another data type, a D type, which represents complex numbers. That can be really, really useful for applications. Um, <laughs> And I use that right here. And they use J. Yep, they use J. In Python, I think, there's a built-in Python uh, for engineers type complex data type. First, they use J, whereas Sage uses I for its complex field. OK, you can make an empty array with everything pre -initial or not initialized. So instead of initializing to 0, it's just junk. But it's very, very fast to make. Um, and then finally, the last thing I want to show you is there's um, a function linspace, and you can apply functions. Oh, see, numpy dot that. You can apply functions to it. So in numpy, there are a bunch of special functions like sine, arc, cosine, and so on. And these special functions are um, enhanced so that if you apply them to an ND array, they will very efficiently get applied to every single entry in the array. So when I say numpy dot sine and apply it to an array, it will just take sine of all the entries in the array. And linspace, that's another constructor for an array. It makes um, 100 points between the starting and ending value. <coughs> so 100 like equally spaced intervals. And if you do numpy.sign of that, it gives you back the signs of all those numbers. Um, again, this is exactly like what you have in MATLAB, where you make kind of a linearly spaced array of values, and then you apply functions to that to get plots. Um, there's also something in Sage called PyLab. If you say import, oh yeah. Look at this code while I answer a question. Yes? You go back to this worksheet. You memorize it right now. NumPy.linspace. Or you put in MATLAB a lot and then you learn it. Is it in LinSpace and MATLAB? Yeah. There you are. Okay. Yeah, I was looking up some of these commands like um, save fig and stuff. And when you just type them into Google, the first hits NumPy or pilot, like Python stuff, and the second hits the corresponding MATLAB command, because the names are all the same. Uh, but it's funny that for me, at least, I get the Python one first now. Hey, look, Witten's going to give a talk right now on Smith 205. So um, anyways, just to finish off, there's something called PyLab. PyLab looks a lot like MATLAB, except with Python. If you do import PyLab, you get plot functions. And it's almost every single thing exactly like the 2D plotting of MATLAB. The one thing is that to, to view your figure, you have to use save fig. And so here's an example of that. And you can even like, you can even label, when you do the plot, you can use all the same notation as you use in MATLAB for making the picture look a certain way.